Uh, as Silvia was saying, it's, uh, we're trying to put values and we try to find these hidden numbers. So we don't know what, how much we should value or we could value the environment. We want to try to find these numbers that give us the sense of value. The problem is that there is even a lot of debate about where the value comes from, what are the sources of value and what we should be evaluating. evaluating. So as Silvia was saying, uh, there is this debate in philosophy and ethics asking what, is, what are the sources of value. Values, as Silvia mentioned or hinted at, can be instrumental or intrinsic. What is an instrumental, what, uh, the instrumental value of something is, some, is, as the word says, something that comes from the use of the, uh, as the product of uh, this good. So for example, uh, we're going to think that um, say a fishery as value if we actually go take the fish and consume it. So everything that contributes to an increase in welfare will have an instrumental value. Now, this fishery might have an instrumental value even if it's not consumed, provided that it contributes something to our welfare. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a use value, it can be an existence value, an option value, or, but could be something, it has to be um, something that contributes to something else, okay? It's not just because it exists that it has a value. On the other hand, this instrument, and instead of being instrumental, something could have an intrinsic value. So it could have value just because it exists, okay? And this starts becoming a bit more complicated because there is no clear sense as to why, as to how we can value that in economic terms. It can be anthropocentric or biocentric, and if you remember your Greek, anthropocentric means that from the point of view of humans, which means that we're going to attach value to an environmental good only if it contributes to human welfare, right? Now, this is a bit scary saying like that, but actually it doesn't have to be, because um, you will attach value to anything that contributes to the welfare of some human. So if some human has a value or as a positive value for the existence of a whale in the Pacific Ocean, nobody has to interact with the whale, nobody has to stroke the whale, kill the whale, eat the whale. If there is value that some human attached to this good, it will have an anthropocentric value. It doesn't have to be use value again, right? So it can be broader than usually um, thought. Biocentric instead is something that generates value from the point of view of being a biological resource. But again, it, just like the intrinsic value, it's difficult for us as economists to think of a way to value something from a biocentric perspective, okay? Um, and finally, values have been divided into utilitarian or deontological sources. So the source of value is utilitarian, a bit like the instrumental um, source if it provides um, increases in welfare, if, it, if it's useful for someone. Or can be deontological in a sense that the mere existence of this good in almost Kantian fashion gives us, gives this good or environmental good the right to be protected and give us a duty, which is the deontological part, the duty to protect this good, right? In all this, I'm saying that intrinsic, biocentric, deontological are difficult for, from an economic, economic perspective. And so it will not come as a surprise to you, for, to you at this stage that the economic approach to valuation is anthropocentric, based on utilitarian principles. So basically we're going to attribute value to something, to some environmental good, if it contributes to an increase in human welfare, okay? And as I said, it can be a lot broader than just the use value or the market value, but still has to be um, elicited or recorded through some human valuation of this good. And this is interesting. For example, the, the little uh, thingy that we did, the icebreaker today, was interesting. Because, for example, uh, Federica, who is not here anymore, uh, thought that she had a five utility, whatever, utils, 
uh, increase in welfare from consuming the peanuts initially. But then she tried to engage in some um, interaction, and she realizes that given that she was not willing to exchange this good, then this good must have been worth more, right? So the utilitarian principle and the anthropocentric approach doesn't mean that something has a limited value. And actually, by explaining, by experiences interaction in markets for environmental goods, we increase values. By the same token, if we don't have values for specific um, uh, species, because we don't think they are key, uh, key species in an ecosystem, for example, if our knowledge of the species increases and we think that actually this is a keystone species and we should protect it, then our valuation increases. So all these valuations, even if they are based on our human view and our point of view, and even if we only attach value if something incre increases our welfare, are not static. They depend on uh, context and depend on information. So the role of these multidisciplinary uh, workshops and work that we do is also about learning and sharing information about um, biological resources and from economists, from the economist's point of view, to just making sure that all this information are included in the valuation. Okay, so it's not as bad as Sylvia was making it sound, I think. Right, now the scary bit, and then th this is the only formulas I think I have for today. Uh, what I said before, until now, is something that we can formalize. So, to have value, a good or service must contribute to the welfare, or at least one human, okay? All the items that, co that contribute to the welfare of this human, or any human, can be represented as a vector of goods and services. I call it a bundle, okay? What this bundle is can be very different things, can be the existence of porpoises in the, in the sea, or can be uh, eating bananas, can be anything, right? As long as they contribute to good, to, the, to welfare, they will be con considered in these um, uh, bundles. These bundles are only useful because on these bundles we can define a series of concepts. In particular, we can define, and this is controversial, can be complicated, we can discuss this with psychologists, with cognitive scientists, with um, philosopher and moral philosopher, but economists assume that our preference provide a complete and rational ordering of these bundles, which means that if you give me two alternatives, it can be two million goods on one side, and two million goods on the other side, consume in different quantities, I can always tell you whether I prefer one to the other or vice versa. This, this wiggle here means that X is preferred or is indifferent to Y. So it must be that either X is preferred to Y or Y is preferred to X with a weak relationship or both, in which case I'm indifferent. I cannot choose. They are exactly this, and they give me exactly the same welfare. Uh, if I have three goods, the other thing, and this is even more complicated, it says that if I know that I prefer peanuts, like Federica did, to, I don't remember, bananas, and I prefer um, uh, uh, yes, and I prefer bananas to um, I don't know, the, the little fried pork, that uh, the disgusting thing that he was trying to, to make me touch. Uh, yes, exactly, I don't want to even think about it. So if I prefer bananas to pork, then it must be that I prefer peanuts to pork, okay? So that must be transitive, otherwise I start having problems. If this is true and I am completely informed, well, not completely informed, but if I have these preferences defined over these goods, then I can simply define a utility map, which means that I can find a function, u, that for every bundle gives me a number. This is what we did there, there, right? Implicitly. And then this map is useful because it, it tells me that if I prefer these two million things to, from A and two mil over the other bundle of two million things B, then it must be that the number that my function spits out is larger than the other number. Okay, and this is all we're trying to find. We're trying to find a ranking of preferences, okay? If 
we have only two goods. This actually looks very nice and neat and easy because then I can say that if I have two goods, good x1 and good x2, I can look at the at the couple of band at the bundle x1, x2, and I can find all the bundles that I am indifferent to. And then I can if I have more of some of these of some other of some of these bundles, I prefer everything that is here. What is it to what I'm indifferent to, and instead this dominates everything which is outside this set. This is only to say that I can always rank uh, utilities, okay? But also it's interesting because this indifference curve here, as it's called, which is the, the geometric locus of all these bundles that I'm indifferent among, okay, between, among, shows the, the fundamental economic concept of trade off. You can give me a bit more of x1 and take away a bit of x2 and I'm as happy. And if you buy this and if you think carefully, this means that there might be possibility to sacrifice some natural capital, x2, in exchange for consumption. Or I can sacrifice consumption and economic growth to have more natural capital, okay? And this is basically what we always do, what societies do, right? We trade off goods against each other, against one another. And if you think that this is your, for each of us, there is one thing like this, there will be an aggregate of all these preferences somehow, that if we have a very nice political system gives us the social choice that is optimal for all of us, and we are going to be able to express this uh, at the aggregate level. Now, all these are strong assumptions we can discuss. Actually, there are literally, that can be literally the object of a whole PhD course in economics. So I'm not going to discuss this, but yes. Okay, so if you have these nice preferences that gives you this nice indifference curve, that gives you this nice ball of preferences that you can slice and have these indifference curves, because this is what we're doing here, you can also then make a uh, further assumption. So if you think that humans like being happy, we try to maximize our utility. So you make choices to improve our welfare. It's very hard to imagine that humans sacrifice their own welfares for others. And if they do, you can still reconcile this with this, Framework. For example, there was someone back there, I, I didn't see who was there, but who gave away his banana or something to someone. And he, yeah, and Marco, yeah, he was, he was as happy even without consumption. Why? Because one of his goods, one of the things that entering his, in the bundle is some form of uh, altru altruism, so warm glow because he's done something good. Right? You can be altruistic and still maximize your welfare. So you can sacrifice your material consumption and still be talking about economics, okay? So, you see the, the little icebreaker was actually useful. Okay, uh, apart from kind of come getting to know to each other. Right, if you think about maximizing your welfare, you will try to find the point along this map of utilities that gives you the maximum welfare subject to some constraint. If you don't have constraints of any kind, you're going to consume infinite amount of everything, right? Because you would be happy, there is no trade-off and there is no, nothing that limits you. You're going to be happy by uh, being extremely altruistic and at the same time consuming all you, all you want and so on and so forth. So if there is, somewhere here, some constraint, you're going to find the highest point on the utility function subject to that constraint. I'm not going to do this because it's you know, something that uh, economists do all the time, but it's boring. What, what I want to say is that if you do this maximization for each level of these constraints, which could be income and prices, usually if it's a market economy, it doesn't have to be, but it's, it is usually the case, you're going to have a choice, a level of the good. So you change the price, you get a different level of the good. You change your income, you get a different level of the good. And if you map this, if you do this repeatedly, you get a demand function, okay? 
And a demand function expresses this idea of willingness to pay that Sylvia was telling you. The way in which I usually do this with my undergrad student is to start thinking about, so you go out with your friends, the first beer of the evening, you're really thirsty, you're really excited, you want to spend, you're willing to pay a lot of money. Actually, the beer in England costs something like four pounds, three pounds, but actually, if they had to pay $40 as up here, they would, because it's that good for them. It really makes them happy. Now, beer is not a very good uh, example because it gives dependence, and when you get intoxicated, you're not good at making trade-offs anymore, but let's say that it doesn't. Uh, so maybe the first pizza of the evening, the first ice cream of the evening, you're really excited about, you are willing to pay a lot of money, right? So the first beer is something you're willing to pay more. Second beer, okay, I'm still, I'm still excited, I feel sexy, I, li I like this girl, let's buy a beer to be with her, or this guy, whatever, you, you choose. Uh, I don't want to get into your, your sexual preferences, but also those increase your welfare, so you know, it's up to you. Um, and you have the second beer. The second beer, you're willing to pay a bit less. Okay, so it goes down. The third beer, even less, even less, even less. By six, you are completely full. You don't want to drink anymore. You want to do other things. You go dancing. That's a different thing. There will be another demand function for that. Point is that all these points, all these are measures of your willingness to pay. If, you are able, if we were able not to sell beer by the pint or half pint, but by the infinitesimal unit, you could discriminate your willingness to pay, not in, in a stepwise function like this, but in a continuous function. The concept is exactly the same. Every point in this curve tells you how much you're willing to, to pay for the next additional unit of consumption, okay? So if you are consuming three units at this, at this value, this area underneath is exactly the sum of all these uh, rectangles here, and it gives you the willingness to pay, okay? So we have three concepts here. Demand function, marginal willingness to pay, and willingness to pay, which, give, which means that if we are able to find, observe a demand function, we know how much you're willing to pay at the margin, and the integral under the curve is the total willingness to pay. Which, in terms of valuation, because we're not doing economics just because we're doing it to do environmental valuation, it means that if we are able to estimate a demand function, we know how much you're willing to pay for any quantity of the good. And if you think about, if you're operating, trying to go out and buy this pair, you will compare the price of the pair to your willingness to pay, and this tells you how much you want to consume. Now, if you consume three pairs or three beers, you pay this amount here, and that's the market value of that pair, but there is also this bit here that is called consumer surplus, and it's surplus because it gives you the difference between the value and the market price, and the market value. So your willingness to pay is different from the market value. So at the very least, if you're doing valuation and you know market values, you have a lower bound on, your, on the valuation. So it's, you're underestimating the valuation, okay? So that's something that we're going to look at. It's possible to do, but it gives you the lower bound. So if you come up with a number for this B, and you want to, make, uh, to, want to give this number to your policymakers, make sure you mention that there is a lot more that you're not estimating, okay? Right, so this is willingness to pay. If we do this willingness to pay exercise and demand function estimation for, okay, this is, you can imagine that, okay, this is not particularly interesting, but so what, I, what I'm doing here is just to draw the atten your attention to the fact that some demand functions are steeper than others, and this has an economic intuition behind it. So if I really like this good, right? Say, or if I really need this good, it doesn't matter how much the price changes, the changes in quantity is very small. Because when the price increase, the reduction in quantity is actually limited. Think about, you have a, a, a gasoline car and you have to buy gasoline to use it. The price of gasoline 
changes, increases, but you still need to, if you want to use your car, you still need to buy it. So gasoline is an inelastic good. You really need a lot of, you, you're going to sacrifice a lot of other things to buy gasoline. And if this is an environmental good, it might be that this good has a kind of a threshold effect. It's you really need to consume it at that level or your uh, happiness or welfare or uh, utility really drops significantly. So the curve is going to be very steep, which means that there is a lot of willingness to pay for that good, right? Because when this curve goes very, 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 very high, the integral under the curve is going to be larger. And other goods are flatter because the moment you get to the third pizza of the evening, whatever. <laughs> so you're not going to buy another one even if the price drops a lot, okay? On the other hand, the price effect is only one aspect because if you have more income, if you're richer, you consume more in general of almost every goods. Now, we're not getting to inferior goods and other stuff that have delighted hundreds of undergraduates in economics for ages, but remember that if income increases, your willingness to pay increases, right? And this tells you something about environmental quality and preservation, because if you do an exercise on valuation in the US, where even if given the same preferences, if you do, an, well actually let, let's not do US because it's, it's a bit tricky, but let's say Luxembourg, if you do evaluation in Luxembourg, you get very high willingness to pay. If you do it in Gambia or in Zambia, you get very low. And it's not because they have different preferences, but it's not just the willingness to pay, it's the ability to pay that matters, right? All right, so it was actually kind of useful to have this slide, sorry. Uh, I always double guess myself, okay. If you do this valuation exercise and you estimate demand functions and willingness to pay for individual A, B, and C, it's useful, but it's not particularly interesting for your policy maker who has to make a, an aggregate decision about, you know, doing a policy uh, change that affects millions of people in Bogota or not, okay? So if you think about it, for each level of the willingness to pay, you know how, ma how many goods this person is willing to pay, is going to buy, is going to buy 10 goods, meaning that this is the willingness to pay, this other person has a lower willingness to pay, so this area here, and it's going to buy only six goods. The lady C is going to buy eight goods and has this willingness to pay. If we know that for a level, a price, say, of eight, we, get, we, we have 10 plus six plus eight, we know that in the, if this is all the economy, the aggregate economy will buy 24 goods. As the price change, you can sum horizontally these goods, and I have an aggregate picture. Why have I summed horizontally is because these 10 goods are the 10 beers that this guy drinks, these are the six beers that this person drinks, and these are the eight beers that this other lady drinks. So they're different beers. Hmm? These are rival goods. If I drink a beer, you don't drink it, right? There are different types of goods that we see in a second for which I, I have to sum vertically. And this is a completely kettle of fish and it's going to give us a lot of other problems in valuation, okay? But if this is a simple market good with, which is excludable and, and rival, you can aggregate this way and lo and behold, trust me, you can do the maths, but the area underneath this curve is the same as the sum of the areas underneath these curves. So it means that if I aggregate and do the willingness to pay here, I get the sum of the willingness to pay for the three. Okay? I'm not sure what I'm doing with time. It's okay. 12.30 is I have to finish, right? Okay, I'll finish early. I'm saying, I always start saying that and then I go long. Okay. Um, so in terms of what we are going to try to do in this course, we're not looking really at markets, changes in prices. We're going to try to, to value discrete, usually discrete changes in some provision of environmental goods. Say that Q1 is current situation of, I don't know. Uh, huh? Quality of water, okay. Or yeah, quality of water in, uh, in Bogota. 
pipe water in Bogota. Okay, this is the willingness to pay here. This is interesting, but it's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is trying to tell the government what is the welfare increase from putting some money, enough money to improve the, to reduce the loss rate of water or the contamination of water that gets our quality of water from Q1 to Q2. Okay, we want to find the difference in value between quantity one and quantity two, which is, if you look at the high curve here, is a difference between the large area that I'm indicating here and the smaller unshaded area. So it's A plus B, okay? So we're looking at discrete changes. We're going to try to find a number for A plus B, okay? We're not doing marginal things. Usually we're looking at big changes, discrete changes. So we're looking at the benefits of an environmental policy, which is the difference A plus B between willingness to pay under quantity one and willingness to pay under quantity two. Okay, and again, this benefit is sensitive to income, it will be sensitive to the slope of the demand function, it will be sensitive to a lot of other things. Okay, it's actually sensitive also to the, 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 the way in which you feel when you're actually asking the valuation question. So it's, it's tricky, right? That's why you need large samples. And um, yeah, this means that these institutions matters because it's not only the income, but also is the way in which uh, you uh, elicit this thing and everything influences this valuation, okay? So as long as you are aware that all these influences play a role in your valuation, you can at least write it in your report for the policymakers. And hopefully, the policymakers will read also the footnotes, right? So if maybe it's not a good idea to put important things in footnotes. Okay, but that's, <laughs> I always make the same mistakes. Uh, okay, so, important. Institutions matter also for another reason. So, say that um, we have a current situation where the water quality in Bogota is quite bad, okay? and the institution, well, and basically you are used and you have, um, uh, and you are trying, you're being polled or asked to express your willingness to pay to go from Q1 to Q2. So this gives you really the willingness to pay because you are saying how much you're willing to contribute potentially to this pub, to this provision of good to get, to guarantee yourself these increases in, uh, in, in quantity, right? This is willingness to pay. But let's say that instead, the quantity is at Q2, and all of a sudden the government says, you know, we are actually running a big bad budget deficit, and we have to reduce um, uh, maintenance on this water piping system, so it's likely that quarter quality will decrease, okay? But I'm going to compensate you on other dimensions, because the fact that my budget is so tight means that I cannot spend money on schools, for example. But if you do that, I'm going to compensate you with provision of more schooling, okay? But if you know that the law entitles you, or the customs, or the situation, the status quo, entitles you to quantity two, then for you now, now you're trying to say how much you're going to sacrifice to get to Q1. And this measure A plus B is no longer a willingness to pay, but technically is a willingness to accept compensation for a reduction in environmental quality. Now, I don't want to bore you with all the, the details, but these are two very different things. In particular, willingness to pay is gonna be higher. There is a behavioral economist back there that is going to tell you all about kink demand curves. And if you are entitled to quantity two and you have to express your willingness to accept, is going to be a very different number than if you are Q1 and you express willingness to pay. So the point is that institution matters means that if you're trying to do this valuation, make sure you ask a willingness to accept quans, uh, uh, question. Otherwise, it might be very expensive for the government to do that change. And it's also wrong, right? Okay, sorry. That's uh, willingness to pay and willingness to accept are two different things they are still somehow related to this measure here. Okay, somehow. The economists know what I'm talking about. For the rest, 
is okay, willingness to pay under a market demand curve is okay. Good enough for the moment. Um, on the other hand, you want to try to see how much it costs to provide water quality, and you have to think about, okay, if I want to produce uh, or pre pro uh, make sure that I do enough investment or maintenance on a water system to have quality, quantity of output, in this case one, I have to spend some money, I have to hire some workers that go around maybe once a week or twice a week to check that the pipes are not leaking, I have to buy new pipes, I have to replace pipes even every other year, say, and I have quality one, so this is how much I, it costs me to produce the first good. If I want to increase the quality, I have to hire more people to do more maintenance, I have to buy better materials, I want to make sure that I have maybe remote sensing to make sure that when the water pressure falls, I know that there is a leak somewhere, these kind of things. So as the water quality requirement increases, the costs increases, I have to pay more. If I can, again, do it in continuous, continuously, I can have a measure, a curve that measures the cost to have a certain level of quality. Going from one to two gives me this increase in cost. If I do it in continuous, continuously, this point here gives me the marginal cost of producing the next unit. So if this is a marginal cost curve, the area underneath will tell me the overall cost of producing, for example, four and a half units of water quality. Why is this important? Because I have to trade off the welfare benefits, the values, with how much it costs. Because again, I'm trading off doing sanitation improvements or water improvements against schooling, right? So I have to know how much it costs in terms of number of children that I cannot provide books for, right? Kind of. The matrix is always money, but you have to think about these three trade-offs. Okay, marginal cost and supply. If you think about the marginal cost curve and you're in the business of producing any good, you look at the market price for this good, P star, and you know how much you're willing to produce, okay? So for this price, you're not willing to go and produce more than Q star because if you produce more than Q star, your marginal cost exceeds your Revenue, marginal revenue, so, so the price that you get for the goods, so your profits go down. If you are a firm and in the business of maximizing your profits, you, you want to make sure that price equal marginal cost is the rule that you follow, okay? So what this means is that for any different level of price, there will be a different quantity that you're willing to produce and sell on the market, which means that this marginal cost curve is also your supply curve, okay? You can aggregate it, just the same as before, and you will get that the area underneath these curves is equal to the area underneath this big curve is the total costs of producing in aggregate that amount of water quality, for example. Okay? Why am I doing all this? Because if I am, if I know perfectly well how much value everybody attaches to every good, and I know perfectly well how much it costs to produce any of this good across all the firms in this economy or all the uh, different systems in the water network that, is, that, I, that I'm considering, then I am an omniscient, om, omniscient what is it called? Uh, know, an all knowing social planner, and I can tell you what is the optimal quality, right? So if I know what is the marginal willingness to pay, the aggregate marginal willingness to pay for society, and I know the marginal costs or the supply curve for, su for society. If I am a benevolent social planner, I can tell you, lo and behold, this is the optimal water, actually the efficient water quality for Bogota. And why do I know this? Because this is the point where the net social benefits are maximized. So there is no other point that I can choose that improves the welfare of society. The, this number here that we came up, which if I remember correctly was 326, is your social welfare. I want to maximize that number. I look at the true willingness to pay, a true marginal cost, and I tell you where this line cross, this is the efficient way of obtaining this. So by trading off your valuations against 
my technical knowledge of how much it costs to produce water quality, I can tell you what, is, what that is. Okay. How useful is this? Not much, actually, because if we look at what actually happens in the world, okay, let's not talk about water quality, but let's talk about some other good. This looks very similar, right? This is a demand curve. This is a supply curve that will cross at some point and gives us a market equilibrium quantity and a market price, okay? What does this have to do with this, the social plan and the market? Very little. Why? Because these two things will be the same only if, bo oh, by chance maybe, but in general only if the demand curve actually reflects all your values, right? And if the supply curve reflects all the costs. Neither of these two things are likely to be satisfied, okay? So, the social economists like this, thing, this idea here, the social planner, and they think, and they tell you, at least when you do Econ 101 in your first year undergrads, that this is a market model and any perfect market system is efficient. And actually, every efficient allocation can be achieved through some market system. Yes, market systems are not perfect and decentralization is not trivial. So, why are these two different things? Well, because only under perfect competition, market allocations are um, efficient. Who remembers the condition for perfect competition? Economists? Who are the economists now? Let's see if anyone raises their hand. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> uh, who remembers? Okay, perfect information. So I know all the prices of every good but also I know all the prices. So for every contingent market that I can imagine, I know the price. So I know the price of an umbrella today, I know the price of an umbrella tomorrow, but also I know the price of an umbrella tomorrow if it rains or tomorrow if it's dry, if it rains a bit. Or it... That's the kind of information that you require for perfect competition. That's only the first one. And there is a market, a contingent market for everything. So today I can write complete contracts to exchange an umbrella tomorrow with someone here if it rains. And the same, con or another, another contract if it doesn't rain. So again, it's impossible, right? Perfect competition doesn't work. And also, there are no external effects, which means that whatever I do, as a firm, for example, I produce something and I price every effect that I have on the external world. So if I am a firm, for example, here it says quantity of paper produced. This comes from a book, a very simple book called Field and Field. You have the reference at the end of the slides. And this is an example where there is a paper mill producing paper upstream from a fishery. So this paper mill produces, um, uses trees, uh, is in Canada somewhere. Um, they produce paper from these trees. They have to chlorinate, well, to, to wash and to blanch the paper, the fibers and all that. And at some point, this water has to be dumped somewhere. It goes into the river. Right? However much dilution there might be in this river, it's likely that the fish downstream doesn't really like being blanched to, like the paper or bleached like the paper, so there will be less production of, of fish in the fishery downstream. As a, as a firm, if, I don't, if I'm not responsible for that pollution, or if I don't have to pay the exact marginal impact or marginal damage of that pollution on the fish downstream, I am going to produce too much pollution. Right? That is an external effect. I don't pay for all my uh, pollution. Which means that my private marginal cost, different from the overall cost of my activity from the social point of view, by the amount of the damages that I'm creating on the fishery downstream. Just as an example, this means that the private marginal cost are different from the marginal social cost, and even if the demand for paper is completely, uh, perfectly uh, measuring the willingness to pay for paper, I'm going to produce too much, okay? And that's, Federica was asking why, why we don't want to, or why are we still talking about having too much pollution? It's simple, because there is very little incentive for these guys here, for this paper mill, to pay more to produce that paper. For them, it's not a cost, right? It's like the same thing with carbon dioxide. I emit carbon dioxide every time I, I drive. I might not be paying my full marginal damage, and 
if I, if I don't pay my full marginal damage, I dry too much, right? And especially if I produce paper here and the water flows through, I don't know, uh, Italy and goes in France, why should I bother? They're French, right? Exactly. Actually, I, I used to live in Vienna and all the incinerators are very close to the east side of the, of the city because the prevailing wind is from the west and Slovakia is around the corner. So the mayor of Vienna has very little incentives for moving those incinerators from there. Yeah, so, beautiful. Uh, if there are external effects, the market doesn't work. Even more complicated and probably more pertinent to the idea, and I think we're almost done, to the idea of uh, ecosystem services is public goods, okay? So, an ecosystem service, as was being discussed before, is something that provides a service that you don't pay for, okay? But also, say, climate control or humidity control provided by forest means that everybody around here is cooler on a hot summer night because of the humidity that comes from the forest, okay? Uh, oh no, it's, okay, well, let's say it. And the point is that if I am cooler because of the forest humidity, it doesn't, does, if I consume this coolness, you can all benefit and I cannot prevent you from benefit from there. So if it's up to me to decide how much forest there has to be, I look at my personal benefit and I don't take your personal benefit in account, into account. But usually markets are bilateral transactions, so my willingness to pay meets the provision by someone else. And my willingness to pay reflects the benefit to me, right? And then if I compare this willingness to pay to the aggregate market cost, marginal cost of producing or preserving that forest that gives me this benefit, I'm going to demand very little because it's very expensive to preserve the forest and if you only look at the marginal benefit from me, it's going to be very, very small. But given that if I consume three units of coolness or humidity, you can still consume three and Federica can still consume three and she's very, very demanding. So actually she has a lot of willingness to pay to be cool in the evenings. All the, I have to sum them not horizontally like before, but vertically. And there is no way in which a market can aggregate vertically unless we get together and form a cooperative and purchase coolness services, it's not going to happen. So public goods tend to be underprovided. If we don't measure the willingness to pay of everybody, expressed by everybody for ecosystem services or biodiversity or whatnot, we'll never get anything close to the aggregate willingness to pay that we have to tell uh, to the, our policymakers that exist for this service. And it's very difficult to go and ask everybody about this. Also because some other people might have uh, might not even live in the area. They might have willingness to pay for that ecosystem service of their biodiversity even if they live in England or if they live in the US because for other reasons they like that forest. So including all the stakeholders in this consultation is going to be very important. Everybody who has a value has to be accounted for or you're going to underestimate the willingness to pay and as a consequence you're going to under provide the public good. So that's a very complicated thing, okay? So, to do this, to do these kind of things for ecosystem services and for biodiversity is a wicked problem, it's very tricky. And I think I'm done actually, yes. And going back to this, the first step for us is going to be an estimation of demand, okay? The, the most, uh, environmental economic, environmental economics, or ecological economics as Sylvia called them. To me there is no difference. To me it's economics, it's tools, and then you can put whatever you want there, so um, it's okay. But yeah. Uh, we have to estimate demand. Most of these tools that we're going to teach you, or that we're going to have a look uh, at with you, in terms of um, contingent valuation, uh, choice experiments, travel costs, hedonic pricing, sorry? Are we doing conjoint? Possibly conjoint. All these estimate or try to estimate a demand function, okay? 
And why do we want to estimate the demand function? Because we want to integrate under the demand function. Why do we want to integrate under the demand function? Because this is the correct measure of value for a good. Okay? That's what you have to retain from this lecture. All the rest, actually what I'm going to tell you tomorrow is that there are also other ways of measuring this which are all wrong, but can be much cheaper to do, and it might be good enough for certain applications. Okay? So, if you want to retain one concept is the concept of willingness to pay, and the corollary is that you need a demand function to estimate willingness to pay. Okay? I think that that's all I have to say. If you have questions, fire away. <laughs>